Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you all had a happy, restful, for some of you, uh, President's Weekend. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Mayor Commission Workshop of uh, Tuesday, February 18th, uh, 2020. The time is 10.01. And the first item on the agenda is Community Engagement Plan. Mr. Fana. Good morning, everyone. It's one of those Tuesdays that feels like a Monday to me, but I'm sure it does to everybody. So we're going to talk a little bit about community engagement. It's an issue that we've been discussing for a while amongst ourselves internally and also with, with City Commission. And uh, it's an issue that a lot of communities around the country have, have struggled with. Um, you know, dialogues between the governments at all levels and, and citizens has been morphing over the years. Social media has played a huge role. Um, and just a, just a political discourse that we've had in our country has played a role. And so a lot of communities have looked at how do we better engage with our citizens and how do we have constructive conversations and how do we get feedback without it being a back and forth uh, struggle. And so uh, we're looking at this, this issue and we're going to present to you some challenges and some options of, that we can look at in the future to better engage and get feedback from our citizens. And we brought a, um, a special guest uh, to do so, uh, to at least to start it off, to kick it off, and that's uh, Doug Sarno. And he is a consultant who's been doing this all over the country and helping some cities get their community engagement um, efforts off the ground. And there's been a few cities that have started in the past couple of years, um, but it's, it's something that's kind of in its infancy. And we're, we're at the forefront, I would say, in Florida. I haven't seen a lot of cities that are really looking at a, a kind of a more structured effort on doing community engagement. I think we're one of the first uh, in Florida. So with that, I'll bring Doug up to give you an introduction. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, really appreciate being here. And uh, I, I know your time is valuable. I'm, I'm trying to cram about a week-long course into 15 minutes um, and uh, really talk uh, about some of the things that I've been talking to your staff about and some of the things that we're talking all around the country about in terms of how do we sort of reinvent how we engage our citizens and how we engage our communities um, in a more constructive and effective way. And I'm going to use public meetings as sort of a, a metaphor for some of the challenges we face in engaging our community and then talk about some of the best practices that we employ in the, in the practice of public participation to sort of uh, rethink and reinvent um, some, of, some of this stuff. Uh, let me just, by introduction, uh, I'm a recovering civil engineer. Um, I, I went to engineering school. I got out of engineering school. Uh, I went to work right away doing work uh, on, on big public projects. And uh, we would always get to this place in the project where everybody really just hated our guts, right? They were just angry and upset. And why, how could you make that decision? And why are you making that decision? Uh, and my engineering brethren would, would always look at, uh, look at the team and say, you know, it's a people problem. Um, don't worry about it. As if, if we could just get rid of all the people, we'd have no problem, right? And, and, it, and it occurred to me that that was probably not the best path forward, and that we had to figure out a better way to engage people, a better way to, to, to engage our communities and think about this stuff. And so for the last 30 years, that's what I've been doing. I, I really kind of transitioned my career away from the technical, more toward the process, more toward the, the idea of how do you engage people constructively. How do you make group decision making work? So I do it both in the communities and in organizations. And, that, and I'm going to share some of that with you and, and reflect on sort of my 30 years, but also where the best practice is right now in this field of public participation. Um, we've been holding public meetings for a really long time. Uh, this is the oldest announcement I could find uh, on Google, but I know we've been doing it a lot longer than that, August 1853. Come on over to the saloon and let's talk about what's going on in the community. Um, fortunately, we, we wised up and we no longer hold things uh, in saloons. Uh, <laughs> our public meetings might look a little different, but the thing is they still don't work. Um, and the reason they don't work is because they're not good practice. Right? Public meetings would never be something, uh, the traditional public meeting is never something that somebody in our field of public participation, public engagement, civic engagement, would design on purpose. Right? So most of us have these kind of terrible experiences of, at public meetings. Um, and, and the reason is because they're not really designed to be good public participation. And I'm going to explain and talk about that as we move through this, this uh, today. 
And the thing about it is a bad meeting, is it's, it's more than just a bad night, right? You, you walk out of these angry public meetings, everybody's upset, and you think, well, I'm glad that's over. But it's not really over, right? You, it has lasting ramifications for you and for your community. Right? You've, you've lost trust. Um, your community has lost trust with you. They've lost trust with each other. You've, you've created misunderstanding and miscommunication in community. Lots of stuff got, got said and put on the table that isn't even true. But nobody, nobody ever sorts through the facts, right? So that just sits there in your community as, as, as a muddled mess of information. Um, we've damaged our relationship with our communities, and the communities have damaged their relationships with each other. Right, their interconnections and their and and their uh, working relationship with each other. Um, we've lost credibility with them, and most importantly, we've lost the goodwill we need. We've damaged the goodwill we need to make civic engagement work, to make our ability to work with our our communities and our citizens work. Um, so, there's a lot of reasons why uh, public meetings fail, and um, I'm going to talk about seven key things um, that I see all the time that are a reason that some of our public meetings um, don't fail. And then I'm going to uh, juxtapose those with some best practices from the field of public participation to talk about how to think about this maybe a little differently than we think about it now. So reason number one, everybody's already taken a position, including you. Right? By the time we get to most traditional public meetings, the decision's already made. If you think about your, public, your, your decision process, Right? And the way you move through your decision process, you spend often years of, of detailed research and analysis. Uh, you clearly define the problem. You talk about what criteria we need to meet to make this successful. We gather information and data. We create options. We, we thoroughly analyze those options. Right? We make a choice or, or, or a preferred choice. And then finally, we make our ultimate decision. And the thing about it is, in public participation, we tend to put all our energy right here. Right? This spot where we have a proposal, basically we've made up our minds. <clears throat> we kid ourselves that we haven't, right? We say we're open to, to, to new information, and, and to some degree, it's true we are. We're, we're asking the public for input. But, but the truth of the matter is, by this point, we have spent a lot of time and a lot of money, and we have deadlines looming, and we have to move forward. And so we're not open to our public kind of suddenly saying and opening up a, a whole new can of worms and saying, hey, we don't like that at all, and here's all the reasons why, and, and, and that sort of thing. Right? So we need to rethink how we do that. Um, and, 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 and because this is just really begging for a fight. Right? Everybody's drawing their line in the sand. They're just coming to yell at you. Right? We're creating a soapbox for people to yell at us and to be on the news or social media now. So best practice says don't start your public participation there, or at least don't put all your, you, the majority of your effort there. Start earlier and set really clear expectations for your communities about what it is we're doing and what role the community can play in that, in that process. We need to put a lot more effort right up front, particularly in defining the problem so that we all share the problem we're trying to solve. There is no way we as a community are going to arrive at, 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 at a, uh, a common understanding of solutions if we don't even have a common understanding of the problem or the challenge that we're facing. Right? We also have to put a lot more effort into defining our criteria, and that criteria needs to be infused with shared community values such that we understand what's important to our community and we reflect to them that we understand what's important to our community. The most important words in a public participation process is, we heard you. And here's what we did with it. Right? And so this is one of the most important places to have that sense of we heard you. Right? We heard what's most important to you. Because if we wait till we're, we're down there, all we get are positions. If we start here, we can talk about values. We can talk about interests. We can talk about things that, are, that, that allow us to make better decisions. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. And we need to integrate public participation into our decision making, not just do one meeting at one point. This is a journey we go on, a journey of learning and understanding and deep um, knowledge building. And we need to bring the public along that journey with us. right? And make sure they understand what's going on and why. We need to communicate more and more often so we're bringing them on that journey with us. And understanding for us and for them, where can public input actually make the most difference on our, on our decision making? Right? 
And it's often not there at the, at the penultimate moment of the project. It's often much earlier where we really can hear and listen and do something with the input we get. Um, and we need to think about public input um, not just as something we have to react to, but as actual data in our project. It's, it's actually going to help us make better decisions. Ultimately, the frame I'm trying to paint here and the frame we look at public participation in from the field of, of engagement is one of decision making. We engage the public to make better decisions. We engage them so that their input informs us and helps us think critically about the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, one of the things we have to recognize is that public participation must provide a real opportunity for impact. We can't, we can't promise exactly how much impact they're going to have or exactly what we're going to listen to, but we can promise that we are going to listen and we are going to take it into account. There's a real opportunity for input. That's very different than public relations, where our, our goal is to communicate, to explain, and often to get buy-in, to get people to agree with the decision we've made, and to help them understand why the decision was made. Right? But there's no room for them to influence the decision, or, or there's very little room for them to influence the decision. So we're more in a buy-in environment. If you're doing buy-in, you're not doing public participation. So we have to really look at ourselves in the mirror and think about which one are we doing. It's not that buy-in is bad. Sometimes that's where we are, right? There's no real room for public input. That's OK. There's legitimate reasons for that. But we have to be honest about that and be clear about that. But if we're truly asking for input, we have to be serious and we have to be sincere. There is nothing more frustrating in the community than to be asked their opinion and for that opinion to be just completely disregarded or never have had a chance to be considered in the first place. So the, the international community, um, there is actually an organization called the International Association for Public Participation. Um, we do a week-long training, and many of your staff went through that training about a year ago. Um, and we did a refresher course this December. Um, they've created something called the IEP2 spectrum. And the IEP2 spectrum um, tells us that not all public participation is the same. You really have to think hard about what you're trying to achieve through engaging your public before you go out and start uh, talking to the public about your project or making promises or setting expectations. And the spectrum says, look, there's, there's different levels of public participation. And it goes from zero opportunity for impact on the decision to total opportunity for impact on the decision. At the informed level, no opportunity for impact. Our goal is simply to let people know what's going on. At the empower level, we're actually empowering the, the community. We're saying, tell us what you want, and we'll implement it. So this is not public participation. This is something we rarely do. And when we do it, we often don't do it that well. Where we work is in the middle. We, we work at this consult, involve, and collaborate levels of public participation. Consult meaning we're going to check in with you at one or two points in this process. We're going to ask you what you think. And we're going to use that input to, as we make our decision. Right? We're just consulting. We're checking in. We're asking you for some input. At involve. We're, invi we're inviting you to, to, to join us in the process, to sit down at the table with us. We're not promising agreement seeking or, or, or any level of consensus building, right? But we're going to bring you along the journey, and there will be multiple places where we ask for your input, right? We're involving you in the whole process. At Collaborate, we're saying we're going to work together, right? We are going to promise some level of at least trying to find common ground at some or, or even multiple points in this process. Uh, and, and we're really saying well, this is a partnership as we move forward. We're trying to collaborate. So you can see, if, you think, if you're thinking about you know, engaging your community, there's a huge difference between consult and collaborate, a huge difference. And we need to be clear what we're doing. We internally have to set clear goals for ourselves. Why are we engaging the public? And what do we hope to get from public involvement and public input on this? Uh, project. This is different from the goals of our project. This is the goals of working with the public on our project. And then once we understand that, we have to make a very clear promise to the public that says to them, here's what you can expect from us. Here's the role we are hoping that you'll play, and here's what you can expect from us as we consider your input and engage with you through this process. Here's the problem. If you don't make a clear promise to the public, if you don't set very clear expectations, then you're allowing the public to set the expectations about the project. 
and they're all going to set different expectations. <clears throat> And all their expectations are going to be way higher than you intend to run your project. And they're going to judge the success of your program not against what you actually achieve, but what they were expecting. So we have to get much better at the expectations game and the clarity game as we move through this. Okay. Reason number two, everybody hates public speaking, including most of your staff. Right? People don't like doing what I'm doing right now. Right? They don't like standing at the microphone. Sometimes you'll go at a public meeting and you'll see people, people they're literally shaking at the microphone. They're so scared. Now, the sort of good news is that public speaking used to be at the top of every list of what people fear the most. It is no longer there. And you're not going to like what's replaced it. What's replaced public speaking is corrupt government officials. I had to read that three times before I thought that they were serious. That is what people reporting fearing the most in polls now. So that doesn't really help you, um, but, but, but it's an interesting thing. But, but public speaking is still something people are really scared of, right? It's, it's, it's way above other, other really serious fears like flying, zombies, clowns, right? <laughs> People would rather, rather take an airplane ride with, some, with a bunch of zombie clowns than, than stand at a microphone at one of your public meetings. Right? Yet that's what we do for them to be heard. We make them be in an uncomfortable environment. Right? And your staff's uncomfortable there too. Right? We need to do a better job preparing staff. We're not, I'm not letting staff off the hook. We do have to give presentations. We do have to you know, do that work. But we have to be more, more conscientious of who we put in front of the room and how comfortable they are there and how well prepared they are to do those things that we need to do to engage our public. So what we, what we talk about a lot in, in the field is dialogue. We talk about creating environments for dialogue, getting away from the two minutes of a, at a microphone or that, that public speaking environment, but creating really dynamic and comfortable and, and, and inviting and even exciting opportunities for people to sit down and talk to each other. So there's a lot of things that happen when you, when you move people into smaller groups and smaller tables uh, and, and engagement. One is they're much more comfortable. They talk much more from the heart. They're not just yelling at you and, 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 and trying to make points or, or score points. Um, they're also talking to each other. They're also listening to each other more. Right? So we want to try to create these more uh, comfortable environments. So dialogue is the opposite of, of argument. And, and we spend most of our time in argument. Argument looks like my point, your point, my point, your point, my point, your point, and the whole time you're making your point, all I'm doing is thinking about my next point and how to refute the point you're making. Right? My objective is to win. It's to, it's to, it's to, it's to actu absolutely defeat you. I don't really care that much about facts. I, it's all about me. It's all about uh, uh, being in, in a battle. Uh, and rudeness and lack of civility is fine more and more. There's kind of a middle ground, which is discussion, conversation, right? I'm still trying to be understood. Um, I'm still trying to push my, my agenda. But I see you more as being, having to be, be convinced, not defeated. Um, politeness is expected. I will take some time to listen to you. We'll argue a little bit about my stuff, and then we'll argue a little bit about your stuff. I'm, I'm a little more open-minded. But when we talk about dialogue, we're talking about crossing a threshold into a place where people are actually listening and hearing each other. They, they recognize that I know you have very different opinions than me, but I value the ability to try to understand what they are and how you got there. There's a sense of collegiality and, 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 and brotherhood that takes over in, in, a, in a dialogue, right? I, I'm, I'm listening to you not because I'm just waiting for, for my turn. I'm listening to you because I truly believe that you have something important to say and I want to understand you. Right? So how, we, how do we create those opportunities for dialogue? Um, it is really important. Reason number three, public meetings don't work. Nobody's listening because really they've all taken positions, right? So that's where they are and, and that's where they're staying. Um, we have to move to a place where we're asking better questions. We're asking the right questions. We're focusing on community values and interests. Stop asking your public what they want. This is the worst question you can ask. We keep going out and saying, what do you want? And the truth of the matter is, we can't deliver 90% of what they tell us. And just the act of them 
uh, telling us or, or, or saying um, these things suggests that it's a possibility. Right? We need to be more careful. We need to frame our projects. We need to set context. We need to set sideboards. We need to understand the legal and regulatory uh, restrictions upon us, and we need to convey those to our community. We need, to, we need to make sure that we're asking them questions where their input is actually something that can matter and that we are open to. So we have to clarify what's on and off the table. Everybody walks into a room with this huge set of interests. Most people walk into your public meetings, they don't even know what the meeting's about. They just want to talk about what's important to them. right? So if, if we're going to have an event to talk about something, we have to create context. We have to help people understand this is what this project's about. And even more, more than that, here's where public input can matter. right? Here's where we're open to and legally able to take public input. And we need to focus on community values, what people believe in and their interests, what they, what they believe they need to protect those values, and get away from the positions. Right? As soon as someone takes a position, they embed their values and interests in that position, and that position becomes a, a replacement for their values. They don't see the difference between the two. Right? When we create shared values, we can open up a, a, a range of options for how to, to solve it. Because right? again, it's all about decision making. It's all about getting us to a place where we understand our shared values, we understand what we're trying to achieve, and then we can seek agreement and common ground as we move forward. So don't start at positions. We have to start at values. We have to start earlier in the process. We have to build those, co those shared community values and reflect back to the community what we heard from them, what they all agree is most important, um, and, and maybe some of the things they don't agree about what is most important, but there's usually a lot more agreement in values than not, and, and how we're going to use that to make um, decisions. Reason number four, everybody's angry, and civility's gone out the window. It's not your imagination, right? It's worse, right? In fact, uh, uh, a study uh, and work out of GW University likened anger to a public epi epidemic, saying it contaminates everything from media controversy to road rage to wars to mass shootings. And 93% of Americans recognize incivility is a problem, including 68% in the most recent study, that it's a major problem. This is important to recognize. Your public doesn't want to be in this situation either. They don't like these ugly public meetings either. They don't like yelling at each other either. Right? That's not to say a few don't relish it. They do. OK? <laughs> right? And too often, those are the ones who are showing up at your meeting. And we're mistaking them for the whole community. They're not. So if we want civility, we need to model civility, and we need to expect civility. I've, I've, I've been in these situations for the last 30 years. When you, when you expect it and you hold people to it, remarkably, they'll respond. When you don't hold people to it, when you let bad behavior sit there, everybody goes, oh, I guess that's how I have to behave to be heard. So civility is something we can create and enforce uh, especially at the local level. Um, I, think it's, I think it's kind of important to define civility, and I'll do it very quickly, and I, I, I like this. This came out recently in Psychology Today. They talked about what is civility, what does civility look like? Uh, and I thought this hit the nail on the head, not just for civility, but for how we want our public engagement to work. Civility is people thinking before they speak. It focuses on facts rather than beliefs and opinions. It focuses on the common good rather than individual agendas. We disagree with each other respectfully. We're open to each other without hostility. We respect diverse views and groups. We create a spirit of collegiality. And we offer productive and corrective feedback to those who behave in demeaning, insulting, disrespectful, disrespectful and discriminatory ways. We don't act in kind, right? We, 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 we take the high ground. We take the high road. And we move forward accordingly. Um, anger is something you have to really think about. Also, um, anger is really just passion turned in the wrong direction. You have to figure out what's at the root of that anger. And in order to figure out what's at the root of that anger, you have to show things that we don't normally show. Empathy, compassion, honesty, and commitment um, before we prove competence. There's a saying in public participation, 
I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. Right? That leads to the fifth thing. Uh, nobody trusts you. They don't trust each other. Um, credibility is the quality of being trusted and believed in. And government's loss of credibility is actually a word, uh, a phrase used in the dictionary to describe credibility. 29% of Americans view government officials as credible. And only 15% believe that the government's working for them. Right? The response to this is relationship building. Right? You've got to earn trust in today's world. You don't just get it because of your official. And experience isn't enough. You've got to think about the heart and the mind as you go out and do this work. Fully half of the work you need to be doing is, is around caring and empathy. Right? We think our credibility is all based on our capacity for doing good work. It's not. It's how we express it and how we treat people. Right? I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to quickly move through a couple things. We want to move from this, where every uh, stakeholder thinks they're in an individual negotiation with us, to this, where we start getting people to talk to each other and understand that our job is to make the best decision for the most people. And they have to understand how un other people think, too. Recognize that people don't understand government. Right? Harvard study says that American education system fails to convey basic civics knowledge to students. It means our adults don't understand civics either. Even worse, 10% of college seniors believe that Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court, right? We have a lot of work to do, right? And um, we don't think it's our job, but it is our job. We need to teach people civics. We need to teach people that they have both rights and responsibilities as citizens. We keep making them think that we're just the complaint department, right? That they come to public meetings just to yell at us. That is not why we hold public meetings. We hold public meetings to engage people meaningfully in the work of governing. That's the role of, of public participation. You know, it's hard work. Good governance is hard work. We need to make the best decisions for the most people. Not everybody can get their way. We have to stop telling people what we think they want to hear. We have to start telling them the truth and, and the challenges that we face. We have to explain how things work. I can't tell you how many times that I get to a point where somebody finally explains something in a way that resonates with the community, and they just go, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? Months, years of, of, of anguish and conflict, and suddenly there's a moment where they go, oh, well, why didn't you tell us that before, right? You have to get there to, to the place where they live and to explain it to them in a way they do. Last reason, your community's not in the room. When you're holding public meetings, you're talking to the same 10 people over and over and over again. And they tend to be the loudest, angriest, most annoying stakeholders you have. Right? So you have to think about, how do I reach the whole community? How do I talk to the whole community? Right? Our best practice is that your, your public participation should look like the community that you serve. Right? Not just the special interests on the tails of the curve the general public that's in the middle. Oftentimes, in your public meetings, the public is missing. Right? And in fact, what we've, we've taken to start to use the public as a term as if everybody's the same and they all think the same way. But when you say the public, what you're really talking about are the loudest, angriest stakeholders because those are the people that are in your face constantly. And you've got to broaden that and think about that uh, in a much more substantive way. So finally, in summary, this is a process. It's not a meeting. No one meeting can ever engage your community. Right? Your community is an asset to good governance. You're just not hearing from them because you're spending too much time with the usual suspects. Right? But the broader community doesn't know how to do this. They don't know how to do this right. So you have to teach them. You have to create processes and ways of helping to engage them. Um, and expect more from them. They will rise to the challenge. The more meaningful opportunity you create, the more reasonable and the more fundamental their input will be. <clears throat> and when you get it right, you're going to get much better decisions as a community moving forward. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was probably the best summary of community engagement since I have been involved in the public arena. Uh, and what I am going to suggest is that we bring you back, um, uh, particularly as part of what, what I wanted to start doing <clears throat> with the beginning with the new commission, is an onboarding process. I think it's very important for us as commissioners, particularly those who haven't done it before, to uh, get acclimated to this job. You know, a lot of us, I know I did, 
it's on the job training. And, and so if we can provide tools uh, to help new commissioners when they come on and even older commissioners as they move on, um, to help them do their job better. This is an element that I think is absolutely essential. Uh, thank you. I charge uh, Armando and, and the team to help us as a city become more strategic in our community engagement. Uh, I think that will help you as commissioners uh, help us do our jobs better as we are out in the community. And, and so that is the, 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 the uh, approach here. Um, we are in the customer service business as commissioners and, and as public elected officials. And so we have to do a better job of providing high quality customer service to our residents. Uh, and, and so we have to learn, frankly, how to do a better job of engaging them in our decision making. So this, this is very helpful and we do want to get you back for a more extended uh, session. Anyway, Wendy, go ahead. Thank you, Mayors and Commission. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, so Doug talked about the external part of this and we started working as um, Mayor Muyu's term was ending and Mayor James was coming on because this was something that was recognized throughout the city and especially on the campaign trail. So my piece of this is working through the internal community engagement piece because sometimes, you know, turning a city government is like turning a tit the Titanic. You know, it takes a long time and um, <laughs> into an iceberg. So our Office of Community Engagement um, is the office that's providing the framework and the resources to assist the city in getting this feedback and documenting it, right? As we're out there doing some of this engagement on the golf course, one of the things I'm hearing is that, you know, it's frustrating that we've been doing all these charrettes and all this engagement and all this work and still, like, where is that captured anywhere? So that's kind of the task that Armando's given our team to start to um, to gather so that you guys have the information you need to make these good decisions. So obviously community engagement is fostered by creating partnerships and there's an internal and external component. Everyone here plays a role. One of the things that we realized is that there's like 25 different departments here that are doing engagement and everybody was doing it their own way. And what that created in the community was a misunderstanding because when everybody's doing engagement their own way, People didn't know what it was that they were expected to, to give, to the input, how it would be used, whether it would be used, whether it wouldn't be used. So we needed to try to get everybody in the room together and create a framework so that we're all on the same team. Doug came in 2018 and he trained an internal group of folks here. Um, this is your community engagement team. It's Jose Tagle from Neighborhood Coordinator, me and Kevin Jones, because a lot of the work that we do has been in the community engagement world. We also rely heavily on our communications department, Kathleen's group. And if you can think about it in terms of community engagement and communications being an umbrella or over the rest of the departments, the strategy is kind of fed up and out by our, our two teams. We've created community engagement liaisons in many of the departments in the city that do community engagement. That way, our team of three can't do it all, but, but there's an, a liaison in each department, and that person is going to be in charge of working with the project managers on initiatives, capital improvement projects, all of those kinds of things. And then if they can handle the community engagement um, with, without help from us, great. If not, we'll come up with a strategy. The communications department, the community engagement department, and these liaisons will be sitting down to do that so that we have that consistent framework going forward. And most of the folks um, that work, that are community engagement liaisons did the week-long training with Doug that we did in, in December of 18. <coughs> Excuse me. So. We wanted just to let you know that how we're doing engagement is going to be different. It's going to depend on the actual project, what the requirements are, and that will come when we do the project, um, um, uh, the project charter. That's how they do it in engineering and utilities. Um, it may include some capital pro projects. It may include zoning changes, um, program initiatives. And the strategies can range from just given a timeline all the way to really allowing folks to drive the development of a street, for example, like we did on Rosemary. Um, and the community outreach for the private sector projects is it's held by those private individuals. So a lot of the folks that Rick's team 
that the, those external players, they do their own engagement. That's a requirement that Rick's team requires of them before they get their building permits. <clears throat> So we worked with um, utilities first to do a kind of engagement framework. So you can see here that there's a project initiated, there's a project planning meeting. Um, that's when we sit down together and, and all determine what the strategy is going to be moving forward. And there's some swim lanes for us. We're currently working on that with engineering and to New Pena. Um, on a way to, to do that with the engineering capital improvements as well. We created a community engagement charter. This will help internally all of us give us the direction that we're going to go so that we can sit down and know exactly what it, that engagement is going to look like. And I think about it in terms of this parks bond that we're doing, right? We sat down as a team. We came up with a strategy. We're working that strategy. We're going to meetings. We have weekly meetings to talk about the way this engagement is going. And I think you can see the benefit out in the community. I mean, I've only heard one person <laughs> that's, that's uh, a little uh, uh, against the park bond. Everybody else is really supportive because they've gotten the information that they needed. Once the strategy has been developed um, with the project team and the roles and responsibilities, we'll come up with that outreach project and the feedback will be captured so that we'll be able to feed that to you so you have the information you need to make those decisions. We've also contracted with these four groups so that on certain projects like maybe South Dixie, it's bigger than what we want to be able to handle or what we are able to handle, that we'll have a team of folks that will be able to help us, much like we have the team that's helping us with the Parks Bond. We want the strategy to look more like this, where we're all working together, moving in the same direction, and that strategy is throughout all the different departments um, collectively. So some of the example strategies that we'll be using are the association meetings. We, we really want to get out to the public and be out where they are rather than asking them to come in here to us, right? Um, one of the examples I use is the pilot pro project that we did on Forest Street. You know, when folks are there, we're talking. And that's how we got the design standards for what we want to do on Rosemary going north. And we're allowing the community to actually have input where they live, where they are, rather than having to sit in a meeting in, in a room. It's a little more engage, uh, engaging for them. We are doing some online and social media surveys, and we're going out to parks and different events. We were at the uh, Sunday on the Waterfront. Unfortunately, it got rained out this week. So we're also looking at some online options. The one we're using right now for the golf course is called Polko. Uh, we, we put it out there to test it to see how it's going to work, because we don't want to get something that's not going to work for us, right? And one of the interesting things about the Polko survey is it shows you where people have voted. And I think that's going to be real important for you all. It's to be able to make some of the decisions. The mayor gave us a charge and said he wanted to hear from everybody in the city. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. It also helps our team because there are some neighborhoods you can see that there hasn't been any input at all. Uh, one of the areas I think that there's been a low response is the RISE initiative area. So that can give our team some input to be able to go out with Craig Glover and his folks to get the actual engagement. Even We've got iPads. We can go out to the community and, and help them give us the input that the mayor and you all are looking for. It also gives us some other interesting data. It tells us the kinds of folks that are voting and what our um, subscriber growth is and then the age of the folks. We're up to 178 votes so far. So my goal is 1,000 because I wanted to get to at least 1% of our, our public. So that's it for me. If you have any questions, Doug or I'd be happy to answer. Questions? Commissioner Shove. Thank you, and, and thank you for the presentation. I want to just clarify one thing, and I have one question. Um, one of my clarifications was, how do we engage with equity? And it sounds like um, you, you have iPads, and you're headed out into the community, so we can engage some of our older populations that may not be linked into social media, et cetera. Great. And then secondly, I know you put up the internal um, communications charter. So I think one thing that's helpful is setting the tone so the community knows what to expect. So when you order a pizza from Domino's, there's a pizza tracker. It tells you who's making your pizza, when it goes in the oven, when it's out for delivery, and when it gets there. Do we have any kind of project tracking mechanism that's a public tracking mechanism? So if it's a category A project, B project, C project, just for instance, you know, different levels of engagement for different types of projects that we can communicate publicly. Here's the expectation for this level of project. We're going to do these types of engagements and then get to this final decision, whatever that may be. 
Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that we would be doing when, we're, when we sit around and strategize about how we're going to do engagement is to look at the spectrum and, and decide based on the types of inputs that we need where along that spectrum we're going to engage, and then that would be communicated to the public. So that's, that's one way. Um, in terms of the equity piece, yes, definitely. We're trying to meet folks where they're at, and we talked a lot about um, target population. So whether it's the elderly or Spanish speakers, the, giving a voice to the voiceless, and that's kind of a, a word, term I've been using a lot with our group because they don't come to public meetings. They don't get a chance to provide input, and so we're going to make a, an effort to give a voice to the voiceless. But yes, along this spectrum, we will decide and communicate that to the public this is the type of engagement that we're going to – sometimes it might just be a door hanger. If we're doing a utilities project, that may be the extent of the engagement. Um, just let them know this project is happening. Now, throughout that, pro throughout that process, we should also let folks know if there's a delay and if there's going to be an extension of the, of the work that's being done on, on the street. So we've, we've just got to keep the communications open and set the expectation early, as Doug and Wendy mentioned. And I think there's going to be some projects, like um, I don't know if today you're hearing from engineering about traffic calming, where a process needs to be put in place and that this is the expectation, this is how it goes, this is what you need to do to get um, traffic calming in your neighborhood, this is the engagement that you'll you know, expect to get, and that'll be standardized. So I see us moving in that direction where some projects, if it's just a repaving, it's going to be a door hanger so that the public will start to come to expect this is what your engagement's going to be on that kind of a project. Sure. Is, is the intent to make that information available online somewhere where you could look at any project in the city and see where in the engagement process that we are? I don't know about every project, but we have talked, engineering and specifically, is looking at doing a website for a larger projects. Is that correct? Well, there would be a website that each project would kind of have some information on it. So we've, we've definitely talked about that for engineering. I imagine the park bond passes. Same thing for some of the parks uh, projects, that we would have that information online and show the progress and show what type of engagement. That transparency is important. So thank you. Uh, Madam President. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. And Doug, thank you for being here with us today. I agree. I think that setting expectations was probably number one on your list for a reason. I think that in, in business life, in any meetings that we go to, you know, we, we set the expectations of what it is that we look to get out of the meeting, what are our goals, what are our outcomes, what are our timelines, clear next steps. So I agree that we should have some sort of um, – standardized way of making sure that the residents and our stakeholders know what level of participation we're in. And one thing that I've appreciated is that sometimes at our commission um, presentations, staff has mentioned, oh, this is part of this subsection of our strategic plan and, and mentioned that. And so maybe when we're going out for each of these kind of community outreach or as we take on projects, this could be some way and we, you know, use some coding or something. And I hear what you're saying about the individual projects being on the website, but will there be some information about community engagement and participation just generally on the website so that we can start helping our constituents to understand that we're looking at this process now? Yes, and we have a community engagement website, so as we're moving forward, we'll, we'll create opportunities to show the folks what their participation is. And I'm glad you mentioned the example of the strategic plan or, or other types of reports that have been done that City Commission has adopted at some point, maybe a couple of years ago. One of the challenges is there may be a plan that's adopted by a city commission, but it may take a couple of years to implement. Same thing with strategic plan initiatives. And so there has to be, some, at some point, you've got to move forward with what was, what was previously adopted. So I think there needs to be an understanding of that. If, the, if there was a process that we went through that hopefully included a lot of community engagement up front, let's say there was a... Um, some kind of master plan or economic development plan, for example, that then the city commission adopts that. It may take a couple of years to implement, but that we refer back to that plan. Mm -hmm. And so that gives hopefully the city commission an understanding that this is not coming out of nowhere. There was previous engagement done, and this is how we're, we're, we got to this place that we're in now, and we're asking for a recommendation for a vote. There was already community engagement done, may have been a couple of years ago, but I think we get into this area sometimes where a couple of years later we're coming back with a project that's part of a larger plan, but it gets derailed because there's, there's <coughs> not the data that supported that it was gained engagement done before. So we're going to correct that, showing you the data and hopefully keeping that. So a couple of years down the road we can show you there was data on the engagement that was done. 
And, and I think that feeds into how do we identify, I think the, the term was community values. Um, we may have to do that on more strategic initiatives, whether it's the golf course, whether it's 8111, whether it's Curry Park. How do we start identifying, not so much the specifics of the project itself, but what are some of the core values of either the city or that neighborhood uh, that should guide the thinking as we enter into more specific discussion of the project? I don't know how that's done. Um, and uh, would, would certainly be open to hearing just a little bit, because we got to move on to other items on the agenda, but a little bit of how that process, that, that, that community value identification process, how does that work? It, it's really just creating an intentional conversation early in the process. And it's, it's figuring out, you can do this by having a series of meetings throughout your community. You can do this on, on an online tool. There's lots of different ways to do it. it. It's really just being very intentional about it, asking very clear questions that are, are at the values level, driving toward values, you know, getting away from the, the outcomes uh, and, and, and before people have really started developing their opinions. So lots of different ways to do it. It's, it's okay. not, there's no, no one way. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mary, do you have? Yeah, just, you a, have? just a quick comment. I know we're going to move on. First of all, thank you for uh, being here today. So uh, what's interesting about um, this topic, when I think about it from the commission standpoint, the mayor and the commission standpoint, is we were all elected on our own you know, personal platforms, right? And that, that's basically what got us into office. And we're not going to always agree, nor should we always agree. But I, I think when it comes to this, this is the one thing that when we miss the boat, doesn't matter who it is on the commission, we really either are a team on this for the good or for the bad. And so I think both in your slide, Wendy, and as you talked about in modeling civility and all of those things, and I think it's just a reminder, it's very helpful to hear this, um, but a reminder that, you know, if I'm a bad actor on that, the reality is from a commission standpoint, not staff, but from a commission standpoint, we all pay a price in that. Um, so probably overstating what we all know, but I just I thought that was important to highlight. Thank you. Uh, Madam President. Thank you. And yeah, actually, to that same point, I always keep this in mind. When we worked on our mission statement at the last strategic planning session, and Mayor, you mentioned at the opening of this that we're in the business of customer service. That is in our mission statement. It says West Palm Beach delivers exceptional customer service. So my question is, and, and maybe a plea, you know, and a reminder to this commission as we move into our budgeting and other strategic planning sessions is that we make sure that this community engagement remains top of mind and top of priority. And, and my question is those, those outreach liaisons that you showed the graphic of in, I think, nine different areas, is that their sole job or is that on top of regular duties? Were they, you know, relieved of other duties so that they could handle this. And, and so that is what I often see happen with communications and marketing efforts is that it's kind of added on. And then what happens is it gets left behind when other priorities or tasks get added on. And so I just want to make sure that we continue to look at that and look at ways that we can be creative and making sure that we achieve these results. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to say, so as an example, one of the people that's a community engagement liaison is Rudy. Rudy is the Parks and Rec community engagement liaison. That's what he does. So he's now just become that person who, who coordinates in that department the projects. And then, like, they're getting ready to do something down um, uh, Palmetto, I think. So, hey, Wendy, I need some help doing some engagement. Can we, you know, get in contact with the schools? So he was already in that kind of role. And now it's just kind of the communication piece between that department and us. And then there are times when there's some small thing that he's doing on his own, whether it's a playground scape, and then he's just doing the outreach at his park. So it's kind of like that. Um, I, each department director selected their community engagement liaison. The ones that got fed back to me were on that slide. So hopefully um, that's not going to be an issue going forward. And the model that we're using is is with these community liaison, these community engagement liaisons, and the staff that are full time, Wendy, Jose, and, and Kevin, is one that we're actually we copied from Boulder, Colorado, in a lot of ways, which is a similar sized city, 
and they're about two years ahead of us in terms of their effort. But it's still, this is going to be a work in progress. Even Boulder is adjusting as they go along. So, Thank you. Anything else? Uh, very fine presentation. Uh, thank you, Doug. Thank you, Wendy. Armando, thank you for the work you're doing with your team. And uh, please keep us apprised as we continue to tweak this. Uh, but this is very valuable service uh, that we're doing to uh, the commissioners, mayor and commission, as well as the public. Thank you. Uh, next item, annexation study. Rick? Speaking of community service, can we get somebody, customer service, can we get somebody to adjust the clock so it reads properly? <laughs> Good morning, Rick Green, Development Services Director, and I love public speaking. Um, <laughs> so what I'd like to do is quickly go through uh, our annexation study. I believe the commissioners uh, were left a copy of it on Friday. Um, but I'll begin by indicating we were just talking about strategic planning. And again, as part of our efforts when we were doing strategic planning a while ago, we had identified six um, functional areas and then we had identified a total of 16 strategic priorities the city was going to pursue. Um, city annexation study was one of those 16 so I'm pleased to say we'll have the first one completed. Um, so as part of that process we we did identify and prepare a summary so we created a team lead across functional planning team um, and dis discussed uh, a summary of what our intention was with the annexation study. So with the cross-functional team, Alex Hansen serves as the lead um, for this team, Angela Van, our planning and zoning administrator, and then Caroline Glass, who did a wonderful job with the graphics. But um, these folks work with me, and I was very pleased with the, with the result. Um, Kevin Volbrick in engineering worked with us, Dathan in finance, Peter Ledoux in fire, Kimberly Rothenberg in law, Joe Ahern in police, and Poonam in public utilities. So, as we were going through this process, we met with them to get their input because certainly the properties that we annex are going to be impacted by police and fire, engineering, et cetera. So the study itself, um, going through the table of contents, we talk about the strategic planning process. We talk about state regulations regarding annexations. We talk a little bit about the history of what we've done in West Palm Beach. We talk about interlocal agreements, and, and Alex will touch upon that. Um, because we have agreements with Palm Beach County, with uh, Riviera Beach, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit up about our annexation history dating back to 1988. And then what we did is we actually analyzed 559 parcels. And in the, in the appendix of the report that you have, you will see that we've done uh, an analysis um, of each of those parcels. So you will see an aerial, you'll see a ground photo of the parcel. Um, we'll talk about um, of the value of that property, w how it's being served by police and fire uh, and water. And then more importantly, at the end, we also have uh, the property appraiser market value. And then if that property was annexed into the city, the amount of revenue that the city would receive. And then at the, uh, the conclusion of the, prop of the study, we also looked at the 559 parcels and then we identified um, a preferred desire to immediately target the properties reflected in the green color. Uh, the properties in the yellow color were contingent upon something else happen happening. In other words, we might have to annex a piece of property to get to the yellow parcel. And the ones reflected in the orange are those that we should not pursue at this time, or at least our recommendation we should not pursue at this time. So why annex? Why talk about annexation? So there's several reasons. So if you look at the map to the top right, you see this is Military Trail, Okeechobee Boulevard, you see how disjointed our boundary is. So one of the reasons that cities annex is the square off boundaries. Not that we're going to pursue every parcel here, but um, certainly if you have a more compact and defined city boundary, it makes it easier for city services. Certainly with any annexation, you have an increased ad valorem tax base, you have additional utility taxes, franchise fees, and again, as we enter into the 2020 census, Obviously, the more people we have in the city of West Palm Beach, the more revenue um, we can derive. And then there's a variety of miscellaneous other revenue sources. Um, so again, we looked at the 559 parcels. Again, if you look at the map on the top right, every city in Palm Beach County has what they call a target um, annexation area. So ours is defined by the red area. It actually goes down to Southern Boulevard. 
Um, certainly other cities will have a defined um, annexation area that might overlap ours. So this is something that as we're looking at parcels, one of the things we have to look at. So with an annexation, you have to identify, is it politically feasible? Um, is it technically feasible? In other words, do we have the capability, the funding to deliver services to that property that might be annexed? And then certainly, is it economic, economically feasible? We don't want to annex a piece of property that's going to end up costing the city more money to serve. So these are three of the factors that we look at with any annexation and part of what we looked at in the review of the 559 properties. So just a real quick history, the last study we did was back in 2003. And one of the results that came out of that study was a waiving of any fees associated with the annexation process. So as parcels come into the city, they have to seek a city zoning category, a city land use category. And based on that study, we have not been charging fees. So one of the incentives that we do offer um, for properties that are considering coming into the city of West Palm Beach. Since 1988, we have annexed 52 properties into the city. Um, during the 90s, we have we um, annexed these 14 properties in the 2000s in the yellow. You see the green the next decade, and in this past decade, um, those in the purple. So some of the biggest annexations we've had dating back to 1988 certainly include IBIS back in 1989, 1,876 acres. Um, I was here at the city at the time. We even tried to get the Bay Hill development to the west of this. We were unsuccessful and they just recently annexed into Palm Beach Gardens just a year ago. Um, certainly MacArthur Foundation was another one at 551 acres, also in 1989. And then the Ross development, which eventually became Oakton, Bay Winds, and Andros. Um, for those of you who may not know, but Henry Rolfs, whose statue is sitting on Okeechobee Boulevard right now, um, prior to Rosemary Square and City Place, he tried to develop a project on the same property where Rosemary Square sits today called Downtown Uptown. It was 3.7 million square feet of development. Um, he sold a lot of this property, annexed it into the city. That helped bankroll that project. Unfortunately, it failed and did not move forward, but Rosemary Square sits there today. And then, of course, Riverwalk came in a couple years after that um, in 1993. So these four major annexations comprise 90% of everything we've annexed since 1988. Subsequent to the Riverwalk annexation in 93, we, we annex only 374 acres because, as you can imagine, it gets tougher as, as you move forward. But all in all, since 1988, we've annexed 52 properties, over almost 6,500 acres um, into the city of West Palm Beach. Um, we, as part of this exercise, um, focused on six areas in particular. So we have Okeechobee Boulevard west of the Turnpike, and we have a, a parcel that we're negotiating right now called the Grace Church. I think Alex may touch upon that. Um, Haverhill around Roebuck Road, there are some prop properties we're looking at there. 45th Street in Haverhill, Military Trail and Community, Okeechobee Boulevard and Military Trail, and then we have a, a, re a really funky piece that I'll ask Alex to talk about it at the 45th Street Flea Market. So at this point, let me turn it over to Alex and we'll take it from there and then I'll sum up at the end. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so chapter 171 of the Florida Statutes is the one that governs annexations in the state of Florida. Um, annexations have to be coordinated with Palm Beach County and include also the county's consistency review with chapter 171. After all, every parcel that we would like to annex is today within the county's boundaries. Uh, there are four different types of annexations. I, I'm gonna mention in more detail two of the most common ones, the two most common ones. The first one is voluntary annexations. This is when a property owner uh, petitions an adjacent municipality to be annexed. Uh, chapter 171 uh, indicates that this annexation or this piece of land must be contiguous reasonably compact and must not create enclaves. I'm going to uh, define those terms in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, we also have what is called the involuntary or referendum annexation. Uh, these are uh, annexations that uh, ne necessitate or need a referendum or consent from uh, more than 50% of the property owners to be annexed. The other two uh, is it's called the legislative annexation and the interlocal annexation. Uh, but again, they're not that common, so that's why I'm not touching upon them. 
Uh, Rick briefly mentioned uh, that we do have some uh, uh, agreements or some previous annexation uh, uh, interlocal agreements that we have entered into with both Riviera Beach as well as with Palm Beach County. These were entered into 20 years ago. A couple of them were renewed within the last decade. Uh, these annexation agreements or interlocal agreements do affect the city's ability to annex certain properties and or provide water and sewer services, uh, regardless of whether these properties are annexed into the city limits. Since, as Rick indicated, since 1988, the city has processed a total of 52 annexations, totaling over 6,400 acres. And there has been, obviously, a decrease in the uh, amount of acreage annex. A lot of this is because many of the large tracts of land uh, are no longer next to our municipal limits. Uh, those annexations, as we went over, happened mostly in the late 80s, early 90s. As far as the existing service agreements, or as well as the service area boundaries, uh, we have some, some here the maps showing the police, fire, as well as water service area boundaries. Um, some of these are affected or would be affected by these interlocal agreements that I reference. Not so much police and fire, but mostly water. Uh, so we have some, as part of this agreement, there's some delineation, especially around Okeechobee Boulevard out west, uh, Military Trail, uh, Haver Hill, and the 45th Street area that limits the city's ability to expand uh, our service area. Uh, so even, even if some of the parcels that I'm going to mention in a few minutes are to be annexed, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the city's water and service areas would be changed. Uh, these agreements, again, would limit the ability of the city to provide water and sewer to some of these parcels. I mentioned earlier that some of the state requirements refer that any parcel that is annexed must be contiguous. Uh, well, chapter 170, uh, as well as compact, well, chapter 171 does define contiguous. This is a substantial part of a boundary of the territory sought to be annexed, has to be coterminous with a part of the boundary municipality. In this case, this parcel that we have shown here in red is not contiguous today to the city limit. So we couldn't annex this parcel uh, unless some other parcels that are adjacent to the city limits, which are shown in yellow here, uh, are expanded. Compactness, uh, a parcel that is compact is defined as concentration of a piece of a property in a single area and precludes any action which will create enclaves, pockets, or finger areas and serpentine patterns. So, sorry, as far as, um, enclaves to um, is defined as any unincorporated improved or developed area that is enclosed within and, and within and bounded on all sides by a single municipality. The example that we have here in orange, if we were to annex this parcel or group of parcels here in orange, we would be creating an enclave. So this area here would now be bounded on all four sides by that is outlined in red, would be bounded on all four sides by the city, but would be, again, a, an enclave of unincorporated land. So state statutes preclude this situation from happening. The other definition is the one of a finger. Actually, Chapter 171 does not define finger, um, but other sections of the state language uh, do indicate that it's a significant or extreme departure of extension of property resulting in non-compact or non-contiguous arrangement of municipal property. So in red, you have an example of what would be considered a finger. Um, Rick mentioned in, uh, briefly the six uh, priority areas that staff identified uh, for annexation. Uh, I'm going to go into detail on some of this. So area one uh, is the area around Okeechobee, west of the Turnpike. Um, again, we also prioritize the different parcels that were in these different areas. So the areas in green are, are the parcels, or the parcels in green are the parcels that we believe we could pursue 
in the near future for annexations. We do not see any obstacles uh, from a legal standpoint or, or economic standpoint from the city pursuing the annexation. The parcels in yellow are those parcels that would be contingent upon other factors. Uh, for example, um, some of the parcels that we identify here in yellow are not immediately adjacent to the city limits. So we may first need to annex parcels that are immediately adjacent to the city li limits before we annex some of these parcels in yellow. Another example would be these ones. If we annex these parcels here, which are south of Okeechobee Boulevard, first we'll be creating an enclave for the parcels that are immediately to the north that are here in yellow. So again, the parcels in green would need to be annexed prior to the parcels in yellow being annexed. A Alex, if you could also mention the Grace Fellowship parcel on the far west, that's an application that's come in. It's a church property which wouldn't pay taxes, but they do own a, a long vacant track adjacent to the church parcel that they've discussed maybe redeveloping in some form. So. That's yeah. going through our and, and the parcels in orange are parcels that uh, we do not believe at this time we can pursue an exchange for a number of different reasons. In the case here, this is the uh, mm -hmm. Vista Center complex on the northeast corner of Drug Road and Okeechobee. Uh, this is a planned development under the, the county jurisdiction. In order, we couldn't annex just one or a few of the parcels here. We have to annex the whole complex. Uh, it, it becomes very challenging, we think, to, to get the willingness of the property owners, which includes the county, to be annexed uh, for all of this area. So again, this is the first area, Okeechobee Boulevard west of the Turnpike. We're talking mostly parcels on the south side of Okeechobee Boulevard, west of the Turnpike. The city limits already go uh, south of Okeechobee, but we're seeking, again, the expansion. As Ricky indicated, Grace Fellowship, right now we're processing an application for a voluntary annexation. Area two, uh, this is Haverhill around Roebuck Road. Uh, we're talking about uh, just a handful of parcels. Uh, there's a, this is mostly on the west side, or exclusively on the west side of Haverhill. Uh, there's a few uh, uh, residential parcels or vacant parcels. Uh, this is north of Roebuck Road, and then at the southwest corner of Roebuck Road and, and, um, and Haverhill, uh, we have also a small shopping plaza. We think there's a possibility for annexation there. The reason why we identified in yellow, uh, there's a small strip of land here that is actually part of this residential Cypress Lakes community uh, that we may need to do something about before we could pursue the annexation of the shopping plaza in this area. Area three uh, is mostly parcels fronting either on 45th Street or Haverhill uh, Road. Uh, this is again in the area between um, Military Trail and Haverhill Road. Uh, most of these parcels are uh, residential. There's a few commercial or a few institutional uses. And Alec, Alex, before you leave that, if you go back, commissioners may remember that we recently annexed the prime property at the northwest corner of 45th Street in, Mil in Military. So it's the area in blue. Um, that portion that Alex is, is identifying was in the county just a year ago. The fourth area that we identified is uh, around a military trail and community drive. There's a lot of parcels here. Um, some are institutional, uh, a, hamf a couple of residential properties, or uh, mostly a mobile home park. Um, there's um, the Oxbridge Academy. Uh, so the Oxbridge Academy, a small portion of the academy is actually the northern part here. It's already within the city limits. The Oxbridge Academy, I believe in 2012, came to annex this piece here. And at the time, they indicated to uh, city commission that their intent was to annex the rest of the school. This is a private high school. Uh, it, at the time, it was owned by the Jewish Federation, the land there. So they indicated that as soon as the Oxbridge Academy acquired this, this parcel, they would come in for annexation of the rest of the school. Uh, that, actu that actual change of ownership happened about seven or eight years ago. Uh, however, Oxbridge Academy has not pursued the annexation. We have contacted them, and at this, they indicated at this point they're not going to pursue it. Uh, the reason why we believe the annexation of Oxbridge is important to the city is not so much from a tax standpoint, because being a school, we wouldn't get any tax revenue. Uh, 
from the annexation of Oxbridge, but there's several other parcels uh, south of there that we could annex if Oxbridge Academy were to be within the city limits. Um, then area five, uh, this is on the northeast corner of Military Trail and Okeechobee Boulevard. Uh, mostly industrial or commercial areas. There's a, a mobile home park that is identified here in orange. Uh, but again, a, a lot of these would square off the city boundaries. These are, this is one of the examples that Rick mentioned when he was talking about squaring off city limits. The sixth one, which is somewhat, somewhat different, somewhat unique, uh, the sixth area, this is a portion of the 45th Street flea market. Uh, um, so right now, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the flea market, which is this area here, is actually within the city of West Palm Beach limits, but there's about 15 percent of the, of the market that is actually within the limits of Mongonia Park. So even portions of a building that are within city limits, and then the other portion, this is within the Mongonia Park boundaries, and then the rest is within the city of West Palm Beach limits. We believe that it is in the city's best interest that the entire plaza uh, be within the city of West Palm Beach limits. One challenge here is this is not just an outright annexation because this parcel, a portion of this parcel is already within the limits of Mongonia Park. So Mongonia Park will first have to de-annex the portion in yellow within their city limits, and after that, the city of West Palm Beach could annex this. That way, the entire plaza would be within the, the city of West Palm Beach's limits. Um, as far as considerations for future annexations, again, some of these um, annexation and service agreements that I mentioned with Riviera Beach and, and the county may limit some of the things that we can do. Um, another important aspect, and Rick will get into more detail on this, is about the city's millage rate. Our millage rate is higher than the county's, so any property that is today in unincorporated Palm Beach County that then annexes into the city would be paying more in taxes. Um, as far as potential city incentives for annexations, uh, we have identified a, a handful of uh, primary incentives. The first one is that the city's uh, planning and zoning regulations uh, generally allow for a higher development potential than the county. So we may allow more residential density or more non-residential intensity than what the county allows. Uh, also, uh, typically our development review uh, approval and re approval process is faster or quicker than the county's. And uh, there's also the possibility for the city commission to offer abatement on the city's property taxes for several years if a parcel annexes into the city. And, and Rick will get into some more details about this. In addition, we have a, a, a handful of other potential uh, economic development incentives or programs that some of these parcels could make use of if they were to annex into the city limits. Uh, in summary, I believe now Rick is going to get into So in summary, um, there are 38 parcels that we've identified in green. Those are the ones we would like to pursue at this time. Um, 108 properties that were identified in yellow that are contingent on something else happening. So that, that constitutes the 559. Um, so certainly today we would like to ask the commission if they're okay with the, uh, the annexation study, we would seek your direction in moving forward. And then the question we would like to ask is the city willing to consider tax abatement for annexed property. So if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see we just did some hypotheticals. So let's say that there's a shopping center that we may be considering annexing um, based on the millage rate. Uh, that, that owner is paying $17,200 to the county. They're paying $21,637 to the city. Um, so a difference of 4400 being in the county versus being in the city. Um, just a hypothetical, if there was to be a, a one mil difference between city and county, that would equate, in this example, about $1,000. But certainly, if we can offer tax abatement for a period of three or four or five years where they're not paying taxes, it's revenue we're not seeing anyway because it's in the county. Um, but if we could maybe dangle that incentive, <clears throat> in, excuse me, in addition to the other incentives that, uh, that Alex mentioned, that's something that we certainly would like to consider and pursue. So that, uh, that concludes our presentation. Um, if you'd like to look at any of these areas in more detail, we can provide a different link where we can zoom in or out or any of the parcels. But. Any questions, Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner uh, Riles. 
Has anyone looked at the demographics of the various areas you want to uh, annex? We have not, Commissioner. You see, because my concern is, given the fact that uh, we still have segregated housing patterns in this community, that these annexations could e easily uh, dilute the African-American vote. Has that been a consideration at all? We have not. We're simply looking at physical boundaries at this time. Uh, one, one note, uh, I want to say probably about 90% of the parcels that we have identified are actually non-residential. So the number of residential units that would be annexed, at least that we have identified in these six, six areas, is relatively limited. And then a lot of them are vacant as well. Uh, several are vacant, but... Uh, yeah, Commissioner Bajuzzi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think that the areas in green are a good start. I'm still concerned that there's significantly large pockets of unincorporated areas, uh, you know, around our city um, that actually, you know, come well into into the city itself um, that make it problematic for policing. Um, and for some other city services, but primarily crime prevention and policing. When you have significant pockets like this where one street is one city and the other is unincorporated, it makes it difficult to have a comprehensive plan for crime prevention and actually going and patrolling areas to prevent crime. So it's one of the, the areas that I've been talking about, you know, areas of concern of mine. Um, I think the areas in green are a good start. I think that um, if we can continue to identify areas that are potentials for annexation that would continue to shore up our, our boundaries and certainly offering incentives, I think, is important because of the fact that our mill rate is, is significantly higher than the county's. Um, I think we also need to do some public education with regard to our, some, some of our existing communities. I was actually approached by um, a community out west um, that said, hey, Commissioner, we saw what, what Bay Hill did and they annexed into gardens and we'd like to do the same. Uh, and I said, well, slow down a little bit. You understand I'm a West Palm Beach commissioner and the, and the likelihood of West Palm Beach allowing you out of the city are, are slim to none. So let's talk about what we can do to make you feel like you're a part of the city or to address whatever concerns you have. Um, but I certainly think Part of that issue, part of the reason why they felt that way probably is because of our millage rate. Yep. So it's certainly something we need to, if we want to attract these bordering areas <clears throat> into our city, I think we need to take a serious look at offering those incentives. Commissioner Shove. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. I just want to make one point of clarification on the request. Um, the intent is to do tax abatement for the difference between the county and the city. So these parcels would, in essence, pay the county rate for some number of years to be determined, not pay no taxes, correct? Yeah, we, have, we haven't identified the program yet, but it could be in some form or fashion, either just the difference or maybe the difference plus if that incentive is needed. Certainly we'd have to bring that back to the commission, but... Sure, and, and I think, you know, part of the request was some direction, and uh, I'll speak from my point of view. I think it comes on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of the annexations that we've considered have had projects along with them. Right. And so, you know, I think that brings some value back into our tax base. The thing that I would be concerned about is we hear a lot about the maintenance of the areas that we already have. And so I want to be mindful to make sure that we are taking care of everything that we have, but also looking at those opportunities as they come along, if they represent a project or a building or some development that we think would be beneficial to the tax base, um, then certainly offering an incentive would be appropriate. And so I guess from this position, my my request would be on a, on a case by case basis of taking a look to see what incentive package is appropriate for whatever annexation we're looking at. Yeah, well, each I, particular uh, annexation request will come back to us. Sure, uh, because again, again, you would, you would have to vote on the annexation, so we would want to delineate what that program would be, bring it back to the commission as part of the discussion. A, a good example, Commissioner, is the southeast corner of Community Drive and Military Trail, where the Shell gas station, gas station. was. The mm -hmm. racetrack, uh, raceway wanted to go into the county, and that they wouldn't allow that development to happen in the county. It was permitted in our zoning. So that was a piece of property that was annexed. We didn't offer any incentives, but it, uh, to your point, it came with a project. 
um, just like the Grace Church out on Okeechobee is, is, is the same thing. But um, for those more difficult projects or parcels like the ones identified on this graphic in yellow, you know, there's going to have to be some incentive because otherwise, based on this, the disparity in the millage rate, there's no incentive for them to come into the city and pay more in taxes. Sure. And I guess to reiterate my position, I wouldn't be opposed to considering some incentive. I don't think I could sit here and say there's a program across the board that I think is a one-stop shop for fair, everybody. Fair exactly. But as staff reviews and comes back with a recommendation, that would be something I would be willing to, to consider. Okay. Any other? Yeah. Madam President. Thank you. And to the point that you're looking for feedback from us about the incentive, um, I agree. I think we could look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but just making sure that we also get information as we're making that decision on the budget, the costs, oh, we would do that. as well sure. as the future potential tax base. Um, just had a question too. I mean, wanted to say thank you so much. This is an extremely thorough presentation and study. How long did this take to put together and, and to complete the study? I believe we started in the summer of last year. I was going to guess uh, about six months. So six yeah. months plus. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's very helpful when making these decisions to have this level of detail. Appreciate it. All right. Any other questions, comments? Uh, staff, do you have the direction that you need to go for? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Very fine presentation. Okay. Uh, next item is status report on full implementation. Uh, Commissioner Raj, you requested this. Do you want to have any introductory remarks before Mr. Hayden comes on? Or? Uh, I think Mr. Hayden uh, <clears throat> understands, and we've had an opportunity to speak briefly. Um, you know, we, we heard about almost uh, $5 million in projects that went out uh, at our last meeting, uh, none of which had the MWBE requirement. Uh, I'm seeing that, and I just want to know what the timetable is uh, for the MWBE program to be taken seriously and that the uh, city will try to rectify uh, the wrongs of the past. Okay, Mr. Hayden. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam President, Commissioners, uh, my name is Frank Hayden. I'm the uh, director of the uh, Office of Equal Opportunity. And uh, in this request, we've been asked to talk about the implementation. And our implementation of the Minority Women Business Enterprise uh, Program was to address the disparities that show minority and women-owned businesses face multiple challenges and barriers to those owned by non-minority men. To qualify for MWB business must have a business tax receipt from Palm Beach County or the city of West Palm Beach. The MBEWB must at least have 51% uh, ownership of either the minority or women owned business. Our goal is to educate the business community about the city's procurement process and the benefits to becoming an M slash WB certified. We've had 10 planned events in 2020. Uh, we had a business at the ballpark, uh, Take the Leap, the first Wednesday. And I uh, bring these out to say that the emphasis that there was about becoming certified as an MWB with the city. We've asked that to have the software modified to be able to track uh, our two programs, that is the SBE and the MBE on Oracle and PRISM, and that's so that we can uh, track the dollars that are being paid to those uh, two programs. We want to increase the participation of the SBEs and MBEs in competitive solicitation uh, with the city. And as you know, we have a reciprocal program with the uh, school board and also with the county uh, for their uh, SBEs. Part of the things that we're doing uh, to attract more uh, certification for our MWBEs is through our communication and outreach, as through our newsletters, our quarterly public events and media, our interface internally with departments, uh, procurement, engineering, etc. Our certification, we've shortened the application uh, and we have a reciprocal program. 
the compliance is that we award, we monitor, and uh, we're reporting what those results are. The timeline, the disparity study was from 2016 through 2017. The study results were adopted in 2018. The program was uh, implemented in 2019. The MBEW ordinance went into effect in April of 2019. The recommendation for implementation as stated in the executive summary, we established the MWE program. We maintain a MWBE directory. We are monitoring compliance with the MWBE goals. Uh, we are reporting compliance with the MWBE goals. We published uh, M slash WBE utilization report, and we conduct a uh, M slash WB outreach. Legal authorized language to be included in solicitations and contracts in spring of 2019. We consulted with Mason Tillman to expand the language in our solicitation for professional services. That was in the fall of 2019. Inclusive of M slash WB goals in solicitations is ongoing. Today, and we're going to talk a little about the dedicated staff uh, that help us make this happen. Here in the city of West Palm Beach, we have three staff that do that. With the uh, school district, they have eight. With the uh, county, they have 12. And with the South, uh, Solid Waste Authority, they have five. Our projection. We projected the MWB certification at the end of 2020 is will equal about 80 firms that we will have certified. The projected M slash WB utilization of competitive dollars is we saying that's going to be about at 2%. The actual statistics to date, actual M slash WB certification at the end of our first quarter was 73. So we're going to far exceed that number of 80 that we had projected. The actual uh, utilization on compared uh, dollars for our first quarter is at zero. And that's primarily because with the solicitations that we put on the street that have had MWB participation, those dollars will not come into fruition until about the last quarter of this year. Solicitations to date. We've had it through ITBs, uh, RFPs, RFQs. There have been 24 of those. The M slash WDB participation is uh, was 14 on those. The non uh, subcontracting has at 10, um, and those are for uh, liquid pulmonary, uh, settled water fumes, uh, carbonization systems. And for those, those are projects that are no subcontracting opportunities on them, uh, and so there would not be any participation. We've evaluated out of those uh, ones I've talked about five. Uh, we have uh, those would include the transportation planning and engineering consultants. There was one. We had nine responses with M slash WDB participation. The general engineering services, there are multiple awards in that one. Uh, eight of the 80 responsive, uh, 79, uh, 79 with M slash WB participation. Architectural Engineering Services, uh, there was one award. There were five responses. All of them had M slash WB. The Security Guard Services, we had 17 responses, 15 of those with M slash WB participation. The educational service campaign for the bond referendum, there were three responses, two with M slash WB participation. We think our program for the SBE has been a very successful one. We're anticipating that for our M slash WB will be just as uh, supportive as well. Um, we will provide you with some information that will show the number of solicitations that have been put out on the floor. Uh, on the street, the number of SBEs and WBE uh, participation that we've had a part of that. So I would say that from my last presentation when I was here in November, when we were at zero, I think we've made tremendous strides in terms of uh, being inclusive 
of our M slash WB participation uh, for our projects. And I think at the end of our fiscal year, our dollars will indicate that we have succeeded in providing uh, adequate dollars for our MB slash WB individuals. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I'm most impressed with the number of companies that have already uh, qualified, have been certified as MWBE. I mean, 73, I think, is the number, and the goal was 80 for the whole year. Yes, sir. And we've had 73 in just in the first quarter alone. So uh, that speaks to your, your outreach efforts. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, questions, comments? Commissioner Schof. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you for the presentation. Um, being a small business, women-owned uh, vendor myself, I can certainly appreciate it. Um, I think one of the things that we've heard here on this dais is um, looking at the implementation of this as a spectrum in the timeline. So we've had a number of contracts that were awarded prior to the implementation of this ordinance, and um, I think it would be useful, and maybe that's some of this information I haven't had the moment to digest, um, to understand which which proposals were put out prior to and if we've had any progress of reaching out to have some voluntary compliance to that and which were issued post. Yeah. If, if I could, uh, um, Commissioner, um, Madam President asked for that information at a, at a commission meeting and we are in the process of pulling that, that data together now in order to be able to make that happen. Um, I'd just like to say we have been working for the last maybe a year and a half, a couple of years with our IT department um, in terms of identifying a software that will enable us to be able to pull that data together by a push of a button. And uh, we're working in that regards. That'll be one of the items that uh, will have to be decided on in terms of you all as commissioner. Uh, it's priority in terms of making it happen. So in the meantime, it is a uh, labor-intensive development to make that happen. It is my hope that we'll be able to pull that data together within the next week, maybe a week and a half, so that you'll have that data to show uh, what went out prior to and what exists now. In answer to the second part of your question is, yes, for all of those projects that are out on the street, we've had conversations with the majority of those contractors. Uh, I'll say for the most part, they have been accommodating to uh, uh, make that happen, to incorporate these in. Uh, some have not been as uh, willing, and so as, as we document that information, when they come back the second time around, uh, then we'll take that into consideration. I think that's information everyone in this day would be keenly interested in. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Hayden, for the presentation, and thank you for the report on that request. I was going to ask that as well. Um, as with any new project or implementation of a new strategy, there are always lessons learned along the way. And I'm curious as if you have any anecdotal um, feedback that you've received or hard data that you've received that maybe you've already made adjustments or you plan on making adjustments to in the future. or you know, the opposite, that, hey, oh my gosh, this West Palm Beach is really doing this the great way and we wish others would follow suit. I like the latter part you just <laughs> mentioned, Madam President. Um, yeah, I would say one of the things that I did learn was, um, as you all remember when I spoke to you in November, my hesitancy for putting solicitations out on the street was because I wanted to build up a database of M slash WB firms. Uh, but one of the things that I found is when you put something on the street that has a requirement for an M slash WB, more people come to want to take advantage of that. So we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of firms who want to get certified based on the fact that we have solicitations out there that have M slash WB requirements in it. So I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is uh, the old adage, if you build it, they will come. And so we have been putting more and more projects on the street. Uh, we've been uh, advertising and campaigning for more and more people to get certified so that they can take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? 
Again, Mr. Hayden, thank you very much. Uh, good report, and thank you for the progress, and look forward to hearing more uh, from you in the future as to even more progress. Thank you very thank much, you. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, I don't have anything under Mayor's Matters. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Nearing. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Johnson, could we, I, don't, I don't see anyone from uh, CRA here. I realize the um, JW store is not probably going to open anytime soon, but if you pass it, 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 it looks like a force. I mean, it really is ridiculous, the, the way that they keep that corner of Tamron and 7th. Uh, and when I say they, meaning the owner of, uh, of the stores, it's not right. Um, and this has been going on now for years. But literally, I mean, it, just, just drive past it. And so can we please try and have, I mean, Cole or someone take a look at that? Whether he opens the store or not, I, I've kind of, I'm, gone, I'm done with that. But at least keep the, that particular corner looking good. Thanks. Uh, right across from our pal, by the way. Thanks. Yes, uh, Madam President. Thank you. Um, while I'm appreciative of the community public outreach presentation, I did, I was hoping that it would also include elements of uh, this technology we've been talking about, software for transparency of requests of information um, when residents and stakeholders email all of us or ask questions. And I know that we've been talking about this for some time. I've been advocating for this. And I, I thought we, we had something in place, so I was just wondering if we either have an update on that or when we could get an update on that. Well, that, that's separate from the community engagement, yes. but I know we have something in place. Faye, do you want to talk about? Uh, yes. Uh, Madam President, we actually are not there just yet to be able to bring that presentation forward. We are working on it, and we're working on two different types of communication software. Uh, one will be specifically for uh, the commissioners. Uh, when you all have inquiries or complaints from your constituency, uh, there will be a program whereby from your phone or from the computer that you all can enter that information. I'll be able to uh, send it out. We'll be able to track it, so forth and so on. Uh, there is also one that we are working on organization-wide through uh, what is currently now called the 822 uh, program. Um, yeah, th there's a broader citywide effort to uh, replace, upgrade the 822 system that Tiffany uh, David uh, for my staff is heading up. Uh, there is a task force uh, consisting of representatives from various departments throughout the city. Uh, they are looking at two or three uh, potential vendors, and again, that's something we want to um, get more information on before we'll roll it out, but it will be a more robust way uh, for citizens to communicate directly with the city, lodge their requests. There'll be tracking uh, capabilities uh, as well, and it will interface uh, with our website uh, so that there will be multiple platforms by which citizens can register complaints, questions, et cetera. So, uh, but that's a broader uh, um, project that we're working on internally. Yes. And from, from a timing standpoint, <clears throat> I anticipate that probably in the March work session, we'll be able to do a presentation on the one that's going to be designed specifically for commissioners. And as the mayor indicated, the other one is a broader program. So it'll come online a bit later. Thank you. Commissioner so Show. Thank you. Um, we had one request come in from the North End um, regarding the CRA director meet and greet, the public meet and greet next Tuesday. They had a previously scheduled um, important forum that evening as well. And so it overlaps with the timing of meet and greet, which I think is very important for a lot of residents to be out. So I was um, you know, respectfully requesting from staff that perhaps we move the hours earlier if we could start at 4.30 or give a little bit more of an opportunity. They have an event starting at 6.30 where a lot of the North End will be attending. So if we could potentially extend some of those hours a little bit earlier, I know you're very tight scheduling, but anything we could do to try to accommodate to get more residents here would be appreciated. You know, my there. Yeah, I think what we're going to do is, and, and uh, we saw that request, uh, we couldn't reschedule it entirely because we've got several people coming in from out of town. Uh, but we will have a window of opportunity around the noon time frame. Uh, Faye, do you want to talk about that as an alternative? Uh, so we'll have two slots where people could come in. But 
Uh, yes. In, in looking at the schedule that we sent out to the commissioners, if you zero in on how it's laid out, there is a two-hour window of time to allow the commissioners to go to the Georgian uh, Garden Apartments river cutting. There will be no individual interviews during that time, so the candidates will be available. You know, if it's the desire of the mayor and the commission, we could have, uh, we can put something in place to have a meet and greet during that two hour window when you all will be at the ribbon cutting. That would allow individuals who can't make it in the afternoon to come during that two hour window. But we really want to keep the 5.30 to 7.30 in tag as we have advertised it. So that would be an option. I think any additional options would be very much appreciated to have um, residents be able to stop in, yeah. All right, we'll put that in place uh, so that that window of time is also available uh, for people to, to meet the candidates. Uh, Commissioner Ross. When will we get their uh, resumes, their CVs? Uh, the screening uh, is going to take place uh, this afternoon. And according to the schedule that we uh, sent out to the commissioners and the mayor, uh, it was intended for you all to get the resumes of the top five tomorrow. We think that we're going to be able to meet that schedule if that changes based on the screening i won't know that we will certainly notify you all immediately but we think that we're going to be able to get that out to you all tomorrow the resumes all of the backup information and i don't know if i indicated that block of time but it's between uh 10 and noon okay. so i don't know if i specified that in my okay. earlier comments so it would be between 10 and noon that two hour block of time and the resumes will be made available to the public online shortly after they're provided to the commissioners yes sir thank you Anything else? If not, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.